introduce Dr. Lavelle Brown to the stage. Dr. Brown is an experienced educator who has held positions as a teacher, an assistant principal, principal, school CIO, and now, president of schools. There we go. <laughs> Currently, Dr. Brown is serving as the superintendent of Ithaca City School District in the Finger Lakes, uh, where I spent four lovely years uh, a long, long time ago and did my student teaching in Ithaca, New York, where their computer science program has grown over many years to, in their words, engage, educate, and empower everyone. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brown to the stage. Tom, thank you. You have me over here jamming to some Taylor Swift. I'm a Kansas City Chiefs fan, have been one for a long time. So, you know, this is a glorious time for exactly. us. I just yeah. hope we don't get distracted. <laughs> oh man, it's, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thanks to all the folks who made it possible for me to be here to share and to learn. And as I'm looking at all the folks that are joining in, I see my friend, Diane Levitt. Oh my God, I love you, Diane. I see so many friends and family on this call. Hey, thank you all for showing up. For the folks who are here live, you, you're here on a Friday afternoon. Um, you could be doing a lot of other things on a Friday afternoon. And right now, for the folks who are here live, you know it's a sunny day in most of New York State. So thank you all for showing up and being in this space. I'm always worried if anyone's going to show up for a session like this. Um, and if you didn't show up, I don't know what I would be doing right now. I wouldn't have the energy that I have now seeing all these fun folks on the call. Thank you for being here. If you take nothing from me uh, today, this next 30 minutes, uh, please take that strategy I just used. Thank the learners who show up in a space with you whenever you're with great learners. Our young people have taught me that. They share, they share with me uh, during the pandemic, uh, we can be anywhere we wish to be. And when we show up, we hope that you see us and you start with a thank you. So thank y'all for being here. And what they've also taught me, uh, which is what I'm going to do with y'all right now as well, uh, please use the chat. Now, because of this new tool I'm using today, I have multiple screens open, but I got to tell you, I'm not seeing myself talk, all right? All I'm seeing is, <laughs> is a presentation and a chat room. So please help my mental health right now by typing something in the chat to make sure I know that you're here. I want to know why you showed up on a Friday afternoon to hear from the superintendent from the Ithaca City School District. Uh, this this uh, gentleman named Bluebell Brown. Why did you come? What do you want to hear for the next 28 minutes? What do you want to do? Or just share anything that's on your heart and your mind. I got to make sure people are on it. Oh yeah, I see some chat. The chat is working. All right, I'm not here alone. Oh, I see Leanne. Thank you for being here. Oh, we're going to share some things about what's happening in Ithaca. I appreciate y'all coming. Anything y'all want to make sure I get to talk about. Thank you for being here. Thanks for sharing. Oh, I think I'm happy to be here. Good afternoon to you. I appreciate you, Sarah. It's been a, it's been far too long since we've been in the space together, Sarah. Thank you. And how does love intersect with computer science and inclusion? Whoa, those are big topics. I got a lot to get to in 20 something <laughs> right there. I got you. I got you. Some things we can do to help our young people feel a sense of belonging. How to? Oh, Diane. All right, elevating computer science and the district. Oh, I got you. See, what I'm doing right now, and we do this for folks who have been following our work, who know me, a Cornell alums in the house. All right, go Big Red. See, I, the things, every time we come together with young people and or adults, we, we start with validation. Thank you for being here and affirmation. I see you. I appreciate you. We can do that even in a virtual environment. And we hold space for folks to share what's on their hearts and their minds and why they showed up. Because see, we use this validation and affirmation time, which we're doing right now. We, we want to two minutes of it, a fraction of the time we're going to be together today. I hope I've established some relationships and some people are connected in the way they want before. See, we do that so that we can then transition to the building and the bridging. What I need to get to today has to be connected to what y'all want to hear about. See, that's what professional educators do. And the things that you're sharing in the chat What's happening with computer science and ethica, the intersection between computer science and love and inclusion, those are the things that I have prepared to talk about anyway. And they're right, Zach, Matt, the folks on the call. See, yeah, the professional educator on this call, myself and many others, we now take what I've learned about you and why you showed up, and I'm going to connect it back to the academic content that I'm required to share. 
That's that building and the bridging. See, we started with validation and affirmation. Thank you. I see you. What do you want to talk about? And now we're going to get to that content. See, uh, y'all hang with me now because I'm trying a lot of new stuff today. Y'all are pushing me as a learner. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Oh, why is that not sharing? Oh, I'm going to share the entire screen. And hopefully you can see what I am seeing right now. Hopefully, if, if you don't see 1992, somebody please let me know. Oh, yes. <laughs> this 1992, y'all. I want y'all to go on a little journey with me. I've taken my folks in Ithaca, the admin team, folks had to hear from me at convocation. So I took our whole staff through what was happening in 1992. Why? Because I'm in a very reflective mode right now. I was inspired by the computer scientist who spoke to us all yesterday as a keynote speaker. I've been inspired by the breakout sessions I've attended as part of this conference. I'm a lifelong learner. And at this point in my career as a superintendent, I'm no, computa I'm no computer scientist, but I'm a computational thinker. I want people to know that right now. See, I have been thinking a lot about legacy and what legacy would I be leaving? See, that, that year 1992 is on the screen now because that was the year I began my journey. Now, I know there's some folks on the call who, when you hear 1992, that was the year I graduated high school and started my journey to becoming a professional educator because I always wanted to be a teacher. There are folks on the call right now who are like, yo, that brother is young. <laughs> All right. And some of y'all are like, man, he's old. Some of y'all just can't wrap your head around this special year 1992. See, 1992, I was inspired to go off to the University of Virginia, full scholarship. I was told I could stay there as long as I wanted to for free. That's why I stayed longer than anybody else in the history, frankly. But see, I went to the University of Virginia in 1992 to become a teacher and with this full scholarship. Now, let me, oh, let me, let me real quick now, what was happening in 1992? There was a lot, was, it was a year for the culture. <laughs> Somebody said it was a good hip hop year. Yeah, look at, you know, this was the year Barry Bonds was the highest paid athlete and people were going nuts about how much money Barry Bonds was making. He was playing for the Pirates. He was making $4 million a year. Who is it? Somebody signed yesterday for $50 million a year. The Dream Team. I remember the Dream Team. See, Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, all those folks, they were off in Barcelona, Spain. I was following that story because I remember how they talked about how they were treated differently in another country than they were here in this, this country. The Dream Team. Great movies back then. For me, it was, you know, the other folks who look and identify like me, but one of the first times we'd ever seen black folks on a screen like this, black folks being in, in, in interracial relationships, white men can't jump. Anyway, I, I'm hoping some folks are now going back to 1992 with me. It was a long time ago. Juice. Oh, my God. I could spend an hour talking about Juice or the Washington Redskins. I grew up as a Redskins fan, all right? And it took me a long time to realize why I shouldn't be saying the Redskins because that was never covered in my academic content or curriculum. You see, 1992, I started this journey. I started this journey to become a professional educator. My first class, you see, I'd have my mentors come to me and say, Lubell, don't use a scholarship, a full scholarship to the University of Virginia. Don't use that on becoming a teacher. Come on now, that's not gonna change the world. You have the talent to change the world, brother. Use this scholarship to do something else. They, went out, they signed me up to be in the architecture school, then I was shifted to the engineering school, but I kept coming back to the ed school at the University of Virginia because I wanted to be a teacher. I was going to change the world. My first class, some of y'all on here who've gone on this journey, go who's. Some of y'all who've gone on this journey to become a professional educator, y'all probably remember that class. I think that we still offer this as a for first year, first semester teachers. It's called Contemporary Trends in Education. You know, and... Um, for some of y'all on the call who've been following my story, you know, my mama passed at the beginning of this awful pandemic. And we've been in the process of cleaning out, you know, our, our home, our childhood home. And I've uncovered a lot. My mama saved everything that meant something, including my, the first paper I wrote in college, first generation college student. She saved my first paper. My first paper was for this class, Contemporary Trends in Education. And oh, I went all in. I wrote about the things that were pressing our industry the issues that educators were talking about, the things that may destroy us. See, I wrote about contemporary trends in education and back then, here are the, the trends that were dominating our industry. Here are the trends that, uh, that showed up in my paper. These were the headings. I hope you can see it. Everybody still see what I'm seeing right now? I have on the screen uh, low pay. 
lack of administrative support. Oh, come on, my mama spent 46 years in a classroom. Please hear me when I say this. As a basketball official and living with my mother who was a teaching assistant for 40 some years, I've heard everything you can say about an administrator, all right? <laughs> Negative. <laughs> she, she complained about the superintendent every day, particularly on snow days. But it was always about administrators. That's why I ended up going off to be an administrator because as a teacher, I was frustrated with the administrative support. Discipline, or oh, the kids, I was one. We were at risk. The discipline issues that were plaguing our schools. Oh, here, here it was. I wrote about low morale. I, as a teacher, wasn't feeling good when I became, when I got to the classroom, but as a contemporary ed student, someone learning about the industry, talking to other teachers, low morale. Yo, let me tell y'all, we gave a survey last spring in our school district. Yes, I've been reading what's happening across the country. I've seen the national surveys, but I want to see what people are going to see in Ithaca, one of the more progressive, highest achieving school districts in America, with me as a superintendent, award-winning superintendent. When our survey results revealed that the people who were struggling, here were their issues. Y'all see some similarities here? No, we, we changed a little bit. We don't call it student discipline anymore, at-risk students. We call it managing student behaviors. <laughs> Come on, y'all. You see, I'm in an interesting place right now as an educator, because I'm thinking about my mentors who were saying to me, hey, you got to do something different. You're not going to change the world by going into education and becoming a teacher. But I wanted to prove them wrong as I was thinking about this this summer after I read that paper. And I was, you know, I was going, trust me, this is going to get inspiring in a second, I promise you. I went back and said, I was going, how has the data changed since I've been on this journey since 1992? The only assessment that I could find that goes back that far, and this one goes back to 1967, but I went back to 1992 and I looked at NAIT, NAS, our nation's report card, the National Assessment for Education Progress. What is it saying about the achievement shifts? because I got into this to change the world for young people, to bring young people who have been marginalized traditionally out of these oppressive systems. And, we, and I hope you're looking at it like I'm looking. If I had more time, I would go deeper here. But what I'm presenting to y'all right now is we can go back to 1992 and the data has been the same. It's been flat. One could argue there's some most, more recent information that shows that uh, young people of color and those living in poverty have done worse. Now, why didn't why don't I show kids of color from 1992? Well, we didn't even start tracking what young people of color and disaggregating the data by race and class until about 15 years ago. I put this in front of y'all right now to stress, uh oh, to stress to you that uh, I ain't having the same conversations no more. I gotta share my screen here. I'm sorry, y'all. For some reason, it stopped scaring. Boom, boom, let me try that. Hopefully, it's back up. I'm here to tell y'all, I, I, the conversations have to shift. I am in year, I'm not, I've been doing this three decades. And I've lost a lot of hair. I've lost weight. I'm shorter than I was when I was in 1992. Like, I, I, I've taken a lot of hits over the three-decade career. And to be stand here and be in this space with y'all today and say that the data has not shifted, and one could argue that it's gotten worse for kids who look like me, and we as an industry are having the same conversations. Yeah, y'all. I don't know about you, but um, I'm about to change what I share, what I think about, what I do. I'm putting this up here right now because I've learned a lot from the young. We've said in Ithaca, some folks on the call can verify everything we do is going to be led by or done in partnership with the young people we serve. Everything. And one of the activities I've stolen from them is this one. They've asked us educators to pull out our sticky notes. And before we leave a session, we're going to write down some things that we should know in 2023 as professional educators. What should we know? Some things we should be doing. What are we, what are we going to do tomorrow? And who are we going to be? Who are we? Go on this little journey with me, y'all, for the next 15 minutes. Go on this little journey with me right now as I explore some things that I feel I, we should know we should be doing and who we should be. See, this thing about no, I've been, oh, yo, I've been a student of the game here. This has been one of the best conferences I've been to in a long time. Thank you for the folks who've organized. Yes, these sessions have been some things that each of us should be immersing ourselves in as far as the research, the best practice, talking to folks. Yes, these are things we should know. We should know what it's like to integrate computer science into the arts. We should know 
what it would look like to help our educators, our teachers, use computer science to touch the lives and the hearts of all of our young people, particularly those with, student, with disabilities, who identify with disabilities. How are we gonna partner with other organizations? This is what we should know, yes. Y'all have been doing it. Again, I'm humbled to even be here. I'm following a, com a computer scientist who's leading in New York City, so thank you. Those are things we should know, but I wanna put this here for y'all to reflect on. What else should we know as we think about changing that data? and leaving a lasting legacy of doing this work at the highest level ever. So I shared this image, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving it up there purposely for a while before I even talk about who it is. I hope some of y'all recognize who's in this picture. But I've shared this image without any prompting with groups all over the country. And for the folks, in, I've been in every state in 19 different countries over the last four or five, five years having this conversation. And I've put this image up for some folks just to look at and it's been fascinating what folks' first thoughts are about who it is. They're teenagers, they're young people. They're young people like the ones in our schools right now. Now, if I had more time, I would really have you unpack what are your first thoughts when you see this image, but I'm here to tell y'all what I think and what I see. And what I'm presenting to y'all is we should be thinking in this way too. Here are some things we should know, that the young people on this screen have changed the world. The young people on the screen are entrepreneurs, athletes, the best. They're computational thinkers, they're healers, they're innovators. All the things that have been covered in this ses these sessions the last day and a half, the young people on the screen are perfect examples of it. So when you hear me talk about partnering with young people in ways we have not done before, I hope the folks on the call know that we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of hip hop. Hip hop is having a birthday. The folks on this call are hip hop pioneers. Y'all feel me? Y'all still with me right now? And see, I want you to know these are young people who have been shut out of the system, told they didn't belong, tracked into the lowest tracks in a particular school, or expelled or excluded. They made their voices heard anyway. And I hope some folks are inspired to go back and look at the origination of hip hop and how it all started because of a back to school party. Folks are trying to raise money to buy back to school clothes to go into an institution that was quickly excluding them. You see, at the time, the world wasn't a great place for the young people on their previous scheme and for the ones on the call on, on the screen right now. For the folks on the call, I know some of y'all, the Bronx were burning. Now I was growing up in central Virginia, in rural central Virginia on the dirt road, and it was burning and we had our own issues in the 70s and 80s. And now having learned from and talked to friends who were growing up in the Bronx, our situations were similar in that young people who look like us, young people coming from traditionally marginalized backgrounds were shut out of all the stuff that this conference is about. Even though we were geniuses and brilliant, yeah, some of y'all know who's on the screen. And the one in the top left corner, <laughs> that brother right there is a hip hop pioneer because he used his technology device, his camera at the time, this new piece of technology to document it all. Yet we tell our kids to put their phones up when they walk into our classrooms today. See, oh, this, oh but this is just for fun right here. They, these are the same hip hop pioneers who changed the world as young people, they were 13, 14, 15 years old at the time. Now they're adults coming back to Ithaca. We got a hip hop hip hop archives in Ithaca, New York. And I've met them and they talk about their story. See, I, I hope, what is it I want you to know? That the work we're talking about as part of this conference is important. It is what we should be doing and talking about in order to increase achievement for all, increase engagement for all, prepare our young people to be global citizens in this global economy. That is the work we should know. But I also want us to know that our young people are brilliant, all of them. And I want you, to, when you see young people who have been told they don't belong or have been who have been traditionally marginalized, you see the brilliance and the genius first. Uh, what should we be doing? Let me real quick, let me get, let me get here. See, what, what, what are you doing? I want us to be thinking about this. This is what we're doing in Ithaca. We're reducing the predictability of who succeeds and who fails. That data that we've seen for decades, we are gonna interrupt that predictability. How do you interrupt that predictability? We interrupt the practices that we know are contributing to that predictability. Standardized assessments that allow for us to keep kids out of our best opportunities. 
code of conduct policies and practices that we know disproportionately exclude and expel. I can go on and on, but there are practices that we perpetuate each and every day in our schools that we are interrupting. Now, let me be clear. It can result in people getting fired, lie, because when you do that, it, it challenges the dominant culture and the narrative. And what we're doing, also, we're cultivating the unique gifts and talents. We're cultivating the genius and joy in everyone. All of our babies we see as geniuses. You see, some people call this strategic planning. Some states I go into, they want me to refer to what I just talked about as strategic planning. Some states refer to it as continuous improvement, <laughs> Commonwealth of Virginia. See, some places call it uh, future focused schools. There's some places in New York State who refer to what I'm talking about right now as future focused. Some, hey, check it out. Some call it anti-racism. I got to say that lower <laughs> so the people in the back can't hear me. You see, there's some places that I've been the last couple of months who won't let me come back because I said what we're doing right now is equity. I don't care what you call it. That's the word. What we're going to do, we're going to do what's on the screen. Take a screenshot of that part right there. Take a screenshot. Take a screenshot. All right, okay. See, I'm going to keep it moving. Because see, and I enter the, this is how it's translated into, hey, going forward, to leave a legacy, 2023, we are doing the things. On, we're going to partner with the young people. They're going to be leaders of this work. We will build anti-racist curriculum for all. Yeah, we call it anti-racist. We can talk about why we call it that later. Anti-marginalization, anti-racist. Our curriculum model is based on the standards, and we're having our young people solve problems that are relevant to them. And if you ask young people what they want to solve, they'll tell you sexism, classism, ableism, sexism, racism. Our curriculum model has to allow for them to do that. Educator identity. What I'm talking about right now, the folks on this call, we all must look at who we are and how we show up and what we've engineered. That's called educator identity work. So before we can build something in partnership with the young people, we got to know something about ourselves first. And see the structures of support, partnering with the community in ways we haven't before, the professional development that's needed to do all of this. That is the work. That's what we're doing. You can go to our website. Hope, hope, my, hope some friends of mine put some links in the uh, chat. Go to our website. Check out the curriculum model. Check out the case studies that our educators are creating and putting in front of young people tomorrow. So you'll see that level of work. And you'll also see how computer science is deeply integrated into all of this. Check it out now. On that way, we, we say CS, CS for all, because CS is allowing for us to, in, to build a more inclusive culture and a more inclusive computing culture. See, true thinking and true collaboration will need to be done with these contemporary technologies and emerging tools. It's not an extra, it's not something more, it's, it is the work. If you wanna engage young people, <laughs> if you wanna engage the young people that we serve, you will see some examples of some of the things we're working on. See, Matt O'Donnell is a brilliant person. Matt, Matt I, I think Matt is in the chat right now helping me out. See, Matt, check it. We have, we have young people who, high school students who are writing lessons for Matt, who is an outstanding educator that Matt has been using to teach in the elementary level. We have a young person who has had an article accepted into an academic journal. Their coding efforts, th this young person has created a, an algorithm to predict the top 100 stocks. Y'all better catch them now, <laughs> right? See, we have young people doing some amazing work. And, you know, see, our 3D printing initiative, a lot of school districts have 3D, print, 3D printing initiatives. Ours has been led by young people. And when you go to the sessions uh, where we're talking about it after school, there are more young people coming to the development sessions than there are all adults at times. See, our initiatives are student-led, and they're done in partnership, and they're connected to the work that all of y'all have shown up here to do. Hey, check it out. For the folks who love to differentiate, go to our website, and you'll see lessons. There are elementary lessons for every grade level. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Zach. Thank you to the wonderful educators in Ithaca City School District Club. When I think about differentiation, I know we call it now mild, medium, and spicy level. <laughs> All right, but the mild, medium, and spicy, we pick, pick, pick your pleasure there. Pick which one do you want? You want something easy, you want something much harder, but we have something for you at every grade level. See, that's the work we're doing. That is the work we're doing. Example after example. Please take some time, y'all to check out some examples of how this can show up in a school district, our small city school district, with a diverse group of learners and educators can do this at scale. Now, I'm gonna 
echo my elders now. My mom and daddy will never let me speak to anyone without talking about who we be. In the African-American vernacular, the who you be means something. It's a habitual action done unto someone or something. Who you be. And over the years, for the folks who've been in spaces with me before, as I truly reflect on who we be as an industry and who we be as school districts, I can speak to we be denying. You know, see, my first couple of years in Ithaca, when we would walk through our highest level computer science courses or our highest level academic courses, math and science academic courses, I could tell the level of the course based on the demographic makeup of the young people in those courses. So I know we be denying because when I look at all of our young people, I see brilliance and I see genius and everyone should have access to the best that one of the best school districts in the country has to offer. We be denying, we be punishing. I know our suspension rates, we were suspending kids daily. We have a code of conduct right now that pretty much disallows suspension, but we were suspending. We were punishing, we were suspending, we were denying. See, then as I would go deeper into the work around computational thinking, and computer science and coding, I was seeing how algorithmic discrimination was something that most folks didn't know about, but it was showing up in our everyday practices and our everyday lives because the folks who were in those highest level computer science courses all looked the same or came from a different, or for this, from the same cultural backgrounds. And when they wrote those codes, it was discriminating against people who look like me. See, I could be saying we be discriminating based on the ways in which we approach computer science, but I ain't saying that anymore. I told y'all I'm on a different journey. What I'm saying to y'all right now, when I'm asked every day who we be, what we going for, I'm thinking about what our young people are pressed with right now, the contemporary trends, it's artificial intelligence, I'm thinking about AI implementation. I'm, I'm all, all that's coming at the young people, if I continue to say we be denying, we be suspending, we be punishing, we be discriminating against, we in trouble. I hope you saw this article. Matt shared it with Matt. Thank you again. Matt O'Donnell shared this article with me. And I read it. I read it again late last night because I just couldn't believe it. You know, most of y'all on this call, and I know the audience, most of y'all know that the CEOs of these major tech companies were on Capitol Hill not long ago. And some of y'all probably heard what Elon Musk said. That he said that there's some chance that artificial intelligence will kill us all. I think it's a low, but it is some, there is some chance. The consequences of getting AI wrong are severe. That is quite a quote from the richest person in the world with such influence and power and access to technologies, including artificial intelligence. To think that the tools that our young people have access to today could in some point, at some point kill us if we're not careful. It really has me on a different journey, y'all, thinking about who we be. Because if I continue to say we be punishing, we be suspending, we be denying, we be discriminating against, we in trouble. And see, this is why I know, this is why I'm inspired, because the young people we serve are so brilliant and are doing such great work. Matt O'Donnell sent me this quote from a student in his class as he shared this same article. And I would invite all of y'all to share this article with the young people and ask them to respond to it. The young person in this eighth grade class responded, and I hope y'all don't mind me reading, but Matt, I want to read what you share with me. The, the young person said, uh, we won't lose sleep over this quote because this is the work. This is the work that we're doing to understand technology, to understand the humans that it affects and to design technologies that lifts folks up particularly those who are marginalized by society and technology. That is the work. A young person said that. That's why I bring you back to the stuff y'all been hearing me talk about for a decade now. When I'm asked who we be, I'm going to say we be loving because this is the new smart for me. It doesn't matter how much technology you have in your school district, what you're rolling out, how you're integrating CS into the curriculum. What matters is how we're doing that in a way that's loving. And are we having conversations about these principles and how this is embedded into all that we do? The academic standards, our reflections, our practices, our, our policies. Is your code of conduct patient and forgiving? Is your approach to cell phones in your secondary schools trusting or caring? I ask you like I've been asking an educator for a while now. And what I know, if you follow our work, you'll know it. What's on the screen, this love, love is not the default in our schools. Love is the struggle. If love was the default, we wouldn't have these kind of gaps we talk about every day. If love was the default, our data wouldn't be flat. 
If love was a default, we wouldn't be continuing to marginalize young people of color and those growing up in poverty. Love is something we got to work on. And if we don't do this, the consequences are severe. I'll leave you all with that. And I'll leave you with, um, while well, I began with how our conversations and our data have not changed much in three decades. I'm inspired and on fire today more than ever. Why? Because of the kind of quote that I read to y'all from a young person in our space. Why? Because of my study of the geniuses who began the hip hop movement that eventually changed the world and pretty much touched every part of our society. They were geniuses and they were young people and they had been marginalized. And because some folks saw them for who they truly were, they changed the world. I love y'all for inviting me. I love y'all for this opportunity. Let's stay connected. My email, I'm gonna put it in the chat. It's not hard to find me. We have some amazing folks in our school district, Matt O'Donnell, Zach Lynn, amazing folks. Reach out to us, connect with us. Let's learn together. I appreciate y'all.